this is Tracy Malone from NarcissistAbuseSupport.com. Today, I'm going to be speaking with my friend Vance Long, who is a cybersecurity expert. And so many of my clients have been hacked, have been, um, even one had her car hacked through her Apple Watch, right? And so there's so many different ways from teddy bear cameras to key loggers to, you know, physical stalking and following you everywhere you go. If you don't feel safe and your narcissist is stalking you, then you need to hear what he's got to say. Uh, Vance is in New York City and um, he, he's got all these resources that no matter where you are, he can help you. He can help your network. He can help protect you. He can make you feel safer. And that's why we brought him in today, right? I think, I think, if you listen to this, you are going to learn so much. So let's go visit him and I'll come back on the other side. Welcome, Van. Nice to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's a good conversation to start and one that everybody is is asking questions about. You know, when when we are dealing with narcissistic people, as my audience does, the amount of, of cyber hacking, stalking, the amount of physical stalking, the amount of torture that all of my clients face um, is out of control. And it just seems on the surface, at least to them and me, as I listen to these stories, is that nobody cares. <laughs> so I want you to give us some insight as to really, you know, it, it's, I think it's pretty common for when you're going through a divorce that someone spies on their ex's email or looks at their phone to see how long they've been having the affair for. But what we're talking about is so much bigger than checking their texts to see if they have a girlfriend. So let's start with the home and how people can be hacked in their home so that they're aware of it. And, and what can we do about it? Well, I think the, the the first the first place that we always start with clients is the is the is the network, the Wi-Fi router. Um, and if you're not necessarily savvy about it, it can seem very daunting. But it's actually, you know, if you can do online banking, you can you can adjust your router your router settings. It's not that difficult once you get in. Um, but some of the basic things that we see are, you know, just making sure that just like. If, if you have a partner that's moved out and you have a locksmith come and put new locks on the doors, you know, go into your Wi-Fi settings and, and change the, the Wi-Fi network password, maybe even change the Wi-Fi network name, you know, um, it, which are both very simple things to do. Uh, but one of the other things that we also tell people with that is, and, and is to go into the router, not just with the network that's being broadcast, but the router itself has a... Um, as a default password, usually you flip them over on the bottom and it's printed by the right by the serial number, you know, original Wi-Fi network name, default password. Uh, you can go into, you can click on a tab and most of them were like advanced settings and it will let you change that password. Um, because what happens is if I can connect to the network and you haven't changed that password, I could go in and kick you off of your network. I could go in and see what all computers are on your network. So we tell people change, change your security level to, uh, you know, use use a strong password for your uh, for your Wi-Fi network, and then change the default password. And that goes for any Alexa, any device. You know, always go through and change the default password on any of those devices. And we'll, I'm sure we'll talk more about those in a little while. But yeah, well, that's where we always start is with the network itself. Yeah, because I've had I've had clients with their soon to be ex sitting in the driveway at night because they had the password and just sitting there. Yeah. And they're like, have they accessed my email? I'm like, because they were in your driveway and you still have the same password and they don't need to be that far. They could be at the neighbor's house and literally be tapping in if they have the password and everything. If they're close enough, yeah. And that's the other thing too. And we tell I tell people this all the time because, because I deal with that overlap of physical and digital security, you know, that there, there's no, fundamentally they're the same thing. Um, it's it's one is applied to, a, you know, physical security is applied to the the actual architecture like the locks on your home and windows and digital security is the same process just applied to the virtual and digital side we put the right passwords you think of passwords as the locks on your doors you think it's two-factor authentication as your deadbolt lock to back up that lock on the doorknob so that's how we kind of do it because we view that's the other thing that we do is and, and i personally have looked at uh, we viewing cybersecurity as, as kind of a literacy project because 
people are like daunted. We live in a very tech dependent society that is also highly technically illiterate. Uh, so you know, we've started to go through and work with people and take. You know, I tell people when we do trainings or anything like, there's no, there's no silly questions. There's no bad questions. Um, you know, we don't, there's no shaming. We take a lot of the technical jargon out of the basic classes. So people can just say, look, I just need you to explain this to me. You know, like I could tell my child or maybe easier because my kid understands it better than I do. Um, and, and so with the house, just like with the outside, we start with the network because everything that's connected is connected to that network. So we want to secure that first. Mm -hmm. And what about, I have a, a client right now that is quite convinced and got something from Amazon that she could tell that there's a bug in a couple of the rooms, but she can't find them. And, and cameras are something that get hidden on a regular basis in this kind of situation. Tell us about that kind of device that could happen. That is something that we see all the time. Uh, I came out of corporate executive protection, working with, uh, with executives. And we uh, had concerns about hotel cameras being placed in hotel rooms, microphones being placed in hotel rooms. So we had to come up with a way to look for that um, while we were traveling, something we could put in a carry-on bag, something that we could go through and, and uh, you know, and, and do 15 minutes in the hotel room and see if there was anything in there. Uh, because cameras, they can connect via Bluetooth. They can record locally with a storage card. They can they can be Wi-Fi connected. There's There's so many different options. Uh, so we couldn't scan for just to see what's on the Wi-Fi network because the camera may not be. But what we determined was that um, uh, all cameras are, are electronic devices, which means they they require power. And power always gives off heat. So what we do, and we've trained law enforcement on this, is we use uh, thermal imaging cameras to scan the room. And when we see an unusual heat source in the location, that's where we go. Um because if the smoke detector's got one, that, that heat source will look really hot if there's a camera in it. Uh, so that's one of the things that we do. But even just a physical inspection, you know, if there's a device in your house that you're not used to, doesn't they can be hidden in routers. They could be hidden in wall socket plugs. You know, just go through and, and make even, you know, technically the, the camera does take a little experience to get used to using the thermal camera. And they're a couple hundred dollars a piece. So some people may say, oh, I can't afford to do that. Uh, but when it's, you can go through and do a physical inspection of the areas. When when I travel before, and even when we found them in the hotel rooms, because you can't mess with a smoke detector in a hotel room, it's against the law. Oh. Um, if we found something that we thought was a camera, we put a piece of electrical tape over it. Mm. So even, even if we didn't remove it, we still stuck it there because legally we couldn't damage anything. But if we think of something, we looked at an alarm clock, we would unplug it and throw it in the drawer. Uh, if we saw something that was not removable that we assumed to be a camera, simple little roll of electrical tape. Just put that little black tape over the lens and the camera is, is on my laptops, on the smart televisions. Just go. Th you're not using the camera on a smart TV most of the time anyway. Just go ahead and put a piece of electrical tape over that camera. So if somebody does get into your camera system on the TV, all they're going to see is a black screen. Wow. You know, that's something that's really inexpensive that anybody can do. Uh, just cover them up. Cover up the laptop camera if you're not using it. Uh, you know, you can you can buy little stickers that won't also that won't the the, the uh, electrical tape will leave a little residue over it. But you can go on Amazon and find little stickers that are made to cover your laptop camera, so that when you're not using that camera, you can cover that camera and it won't damage it or leave any residue behind. They make even little they make even little plastic doors that like are like shutters that you put clip on your laptop and you just close the camera when you're not using it. Those are, the stickers are like $3. You know, the roll, roll of electrical tape is like a dollar or less at, at the hardware store. You know, there's so there's little things that you can do like that. Just cover the cameras. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, what you're bringing up is I, I have had someone with a teddy bear camera in their child. Exactly. Like, it's it's how do you feel safe when there's so many possibilities? If, if you've got someone that's going to go to these lengths, how do you ever feel safe other than getting and, a device and sweeping the whole house? Yeah. So usually like when we do it with the camera, we, we've, we taught law enforcement to do it. And we do a training session with law enforcement where we do a, we sit down and explain to them the process. And this is how you do it like a classroom setting. And then we, we take a break and we come back and I'm like, okay, there's eight cameras in the room. Here's your camera, find them. And we do an obstacle course where they have to look for them. 
Uh, but we we've actually been able to train patrol officers to look for them and locate those cameras. And then if they find one, then they can call someone with more technical experience and say, oh, I found something. Or they can say, I didn't find anything in here. You're you're in good shape. You can relax. Uh, when it comes to caring, one of the things that I do find with with police officers is most of the time it's not that they don't care. It's that they feel helpless, that they don't have the skills I've had so many officers when we do the training come back and say, well, now I feel like I could actually help people because I see this all the time. I work with a domestic, a high risk domestic violence task force here in, in, in New York. And um, probably over 90% of our domestic violence cases involve cyber stalking. Uh, we don't have an exact number on it, but every single one for some point, a tracker on the car, someone's access to uh, an IoT device or put in an air tag somewhere. They're looking in their email. Some form of fashion now is happening in almost every domestic violence case um, that that we see. Wow, that's crazy. Now tell me so about it's not uncommon for yeah. hmm? so so it's not uncommon. Sorry, I cut you off. <laughs> oh no, it's not uncommon. So your what well, your clients are experiencing is not uncommon. It is becoming more and more prevalent for everyone. Uh, because it's quite frankly just so easy to access a lot of these devices. And and what you were discussing it that you're going in and training cops in New York, while I'm over here in Colorado, how do our cops get educated? Because all of my, and again, my clients are all over the world, so this is yeah. just, like how how is it that some are getting trained and others over here are like can't help you? Well, I think I think that my statement about it is especially what narcissistic is is essentially in line with domestic violence and and cyber stalking and working a lot with domestic violence and things of that nature cyber stalking is where domestic violence was 30 years ago mm -hmm. like we we had an ad addition to the women against violence act to add cyber stalking in 2013 that was now 11 years ago and my question is how many phones have you had in the last 11 years mm -hmm. If you took your phone from 11 years ago and pulled it out, would it still work today? You know, this changes constantly. The technology is constantly changing. And one of the things that we're seeing is that um, when it comes to cyber stalking, law enforcement is interested. They do want to help. But there's a lot of hurdles that also come into play when you're when you're looking at investigating. If you're in Denver and your spouse is in New York, your your partner, your ex-partner is in New York. Now we're looking at two different jurisdictions as opposed to right, you know, physical stalking, hey, they were in town, local police knows how to deal with that. So there, become a, there, there becomes a lack of knowledge in the technical side. There becomes a question of which jurisdiction it falls under. You know, so there become a lot of hoops that, 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 that be, you're really confusing for them. And you know, when, they, when people don't know, sometimes that comes off as uncaring. Uh, but I, what I find is uh, like we work with a domestic violence task force here in Westchester County. Um, Every single police department in Westchester County is part of that task force. All there's like 47 different police departments. Every one of them is in it, um, and and they oh quite a, a few times they don't know uh, what's going on until someone calls and 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 makes a complaint. When your client starts to talk to them, it could be the first time a small town Colorado police department's dealt with a cyber stalking issue, and they just don't understand the capabilities. Um, yeah. So there's a lot that plays into that. There, again, it's it's just this like we've leaped into from even the domestic violence world is way far behind than where they should be, right? But oh, yeah. when it comes to the cyber stuff, that is just escalating. And again, it can be hidden in a teddy bear. There's oh, yeah. e-loggers, which a lot of my clients find out that their ex is put onto that computer. So no matter you can change the Wi-Fi password, I believe, but they're still tracking it because that's hooking right to their computer and they're getting a little message right there. How does someone- The key logger will- Yeah. I'm sorry. How do they know yeah, that? the key logger will tell you what the new password is. Oh my God. Wow. Because it logs your keystrokes. So that's one. So a lot of times we've gone through to do complete, either take existing, sometimes we do what we call a complete reboot where you get a new phone, you get a new laptop. We, we replace all the devices. Um, we buy that we buy the devices anonymously so that even the purchase of the laptop and the phone are not tied to the individual's names 
Um, so it, it's a, it's a more anonymized, especially in very leaf, potentially lethal cases, this becomes necessary. Um, but we'll start from scratch. We could go through with a laptop where they do have a key logger on it, wipe that machine and, and reload the operating system, uh, which we've done in a lot of cases. Um, so there's a, there's a, it, it does become technical. We have become very dependent on it for everything that we do, be it a phone, be it a laptop, whatever. And, and, and that is hard for everybody to understand exactly just how much our lives depend on this now. Absolutely. Or how much they can be in jeopardy. Exactly. And, and that's one of the things that we look at too, is we always start with the basic fundamentals and we'll, like, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but you know, th there's a lot of things that people don't know that they can do just basically you're they're in my email. Well, are they, are they, adding, there's, there's multiple things that can happen there. Are they actually in your email? Have they forwarded your emails to another account? Um, have they, you know, so maybe they don't have your password. Maybe they had your password at one time. Maybe they do have a key logger on your machine. Maybe they just still have your old password that you never changed. You know, once again, change the locks. Um, and there's, and it, it, each situation is very different. We go into each situation and we have to, and one of the things we talk about in, and, and this goes with your clients, but in domestic violence is believing the client. When you come in and tell me there's a key logger on your machine, I don't say something like, oh, are you sure? I say, well, let's take a look and see what we find uh, because you have to build that trust with the client. So they, because they won't tell you it's very sensitive. It's very personal. It can be very embarrassing to say this person's in my email, this person's in my phone. So we have to build that trust. And the first way you build that trust is by belief in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's, there are so many ways. And before we go to my next topic, because right now yeah. we're playing in the home sandbox and yeah. I know that there are smart devices and I'm going to say the name, Shh. Alexa, she heard me, mm -hmm. um, game consoles. I've had clients recently, you know, not living at the home, but jumping into their kids game and, and like reaching out to them. So what are all these things? Again, again, there's technology all over our house. Our kids are using it. How do we stay safe? Well, I think I think the first thing I do is we we talk about the Internet of Things, the IoT devices, refrigerators, light bulbs, thermostats. Like it's uh, yeah, try to I try to find a TV that's not a smart TV these days. You know, it's almost impossible uh, when it comes to Alexa. That that goes to a different level. Um, but what we we talk about is we go through and we look at when we buy that new device. Maybe we Google and say, how do I change the default password on this new television or this new refrigerator? whatever it happens to be, the Alexa, um, my ring doorbell, we had, a, we had a client who was, wasn't their ring doorbell that was the problem. Their neighbor across the street had not changed the default password on their ring doorbell. And the stalker was able to access the neighbor's camera and watch their house from her. So now you have to go talk to your neighbor about what they're doing. Um, so that's why I say each situation is very, very personal and very individual. Um, but the fundamental basics for for the IoT, when you're setting up your home network, any any IoT device, smart device, whatever you want to call it, the um, we set up for our clients. We have your personal network. When we set up your Wi-Fi router, usually the routers will let us set up the four networks. We have a personal network. If you work from home, we'll have a work network. All your work traffic, your work computers connected to the work network. Uh, and then we'll set up an IoT network as well. So all the IoT devices are on one, the, the networks are segmented. The IoT devices are on one network. They're not on the same one that your laptop or your phone is connected to. And then we set up a guest network so that if you're having friends over, you just turn it on and they're on that network. Uh, we also tell people when the guests leave, turn that network off because you don't have to leave the networks on all the time. If you're going out of town, if you're going to work in the morning, you can unplug your Wi-Fi at the house and let the router sit there and not broadcast. Uh, you can turn it off. Those are things that we do. That's also actually good for it to shut it down every once in a while and let it clear out just for yourself. Um, but very basic fundamentals. We we do strong passwords on, on those devices. Uh, we use a password manager now because we tell people that if you can remember your password, it's not effective. <laughs> um, so because uh, technology is advanced to that point, uh, a 12 or even 14 digit password that is paraphrased can be cracked in less than a couple of seconds. Uh, but a 16 digit random password, even without special characters, just with numbers, letters, and upper upper and lowercase numbers and letters, it takes like seven 
trillion years to crack that password with a brute force computer. So like when we teach our people, teach our clients about password managers, it's also better because you're not getting, oh, I forgot this password. I haven't logged in this website in three months. I got to do a reset. It's for, for companies, it's good because you don't have password resets. Employees are actually more productive by using it. Um, and it just, it makes it safer. Oh, you get an email from the insurance company. Your car insurance was breached. Your password may have been included. You go in and click a couple buttons and you've reset it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that's one of the things that we do. So we do that with all the IoT devices. We change the passwords. We put them on their own network. Uh, when it comes to Alexa, there is one thing that we do tell people, and we talk with, we also advise attorneys. And if you're on a consultation call with your attorney, we do advise you to unplug the Alexa or have the call in another room. Ooh. Because Alexa is constantly waiting for you to say Alexa. Um, so the question, the legal question for the attorneys becomes by allowing Amazon in the room, have they given up confidentiality? Because you've allowed a third party to be party to that conversation. I hadn't even thought of that. That's amazing. Same thing with the vehicles, the vehicle conversations and text messages. There was a there was a case in Oregon where they threw out a class action lawsuit about vehicles recording text messages, histories, and phone calls. They've thrown out two class actions in Oregon now. Um, and we, we tell attorneys, do not have client conversations in the vehicle. You can't trust that those are privileged if they're being recorded by General Motors or Ford or Mercedes. Uh, and we tell clients the same thing. When you're when you're interviewing an attorney, you know, do you have conference calls in the car? Do you, we have a list of questions that you give to the attorney when you're looking for an attorney? What pass? What what's your password manager policy? Do you use two factor authentication in your law firm? You know, what is your remote work policies for certain things? Because law firms are being targeted every day as well too, as are the courts too. Uh, the, we had a massive breach in Kansas where they've been shut down for since October twelfth, and they weren't. They're still not able to file restraining orders online. Wow. Um, so, so we, we talk with the courts and the judges and the private attorneys as well and say, Hey, this is the standard we need to protect the court system. Because as we know, the court system is already overburdened and, and problematic as it is, but if they're being targeted by nation state actors, it, it becomes more difficult. If you're in Kansas and you need a protection order, you have to wait till the courts open to file for that. Wow. They're back to paper documents in Kansas since October. Oh my gosh. So it, so it's not just the the nasty divorce people. This is everywhere. This is everywhere, and and the nasty divorce people will target an attorney. Like if you're if you're if you're you know narcissistic abuser will target you. You know if they're really narcissistic, they have no problem targeting the police department or targeting the you know targeting the um the the attorney or or, or whoever. You know they you know those if they're willing to target you, they're probably willing to target someone else too. Oh God, as yeah. we said earlier, the the family judges are. Family court judges are the most judges the most that are the most likely to be threatened in of all judges. Criminal judges, everything. Family court judges get more threats than any other judge in the country. That's mind blowing because again, where's the law in all of this? Um, because what we're talking about so far in the house, and we haven't even gone on to start yeah. talking, but as we sit here and we talk about this. The big, the one number one question is: Isn't this illegal? And why can they get away with this? It is illegal. There's a lot. It, it, there's certain things that are the like you said. The law was amended. The federal law was amended in 2013 to include cyber stalking, um, but the technology changes so quickly, and the law does not change quickly. So trying to to make not only the individuals aware, but the lawmakers and the judges aware. I, I, I had a conversation before the holidays with uh, the judges about Apple AirTags. You know, uh, what kind of language needs to be used in a protective order that that is inclusive of Apple AirTags? Uh, you know, those are those are it, those are important conversations that everyone needs to have because we've seen air when it goes to stalking, they're putting the tag in a child's bag, or you know, they're putting a, a, a tag in, in someone's purse, that gluing it to a vehicle. You know. Um, it, it seems overwhelming because it is, but when we, just like anything else, if we break it down into simple, actionable steps and do them a one at a time, it is going to take time. Uh, if you're doing them preventatively, that's okay. It, you're like, okay, I understand this is a process. If you're already in the middle of it, it is very frustrating 
to to say I need this to stop now. It's been going on for the average cyber stalking case or the federal case lasts for a minimum of average lasts for five months. Um, so if you've been going through that type of invasive abuse for a minimum of five months, you're already frazzled. You're already stressed. You're not sleeping well. It, you know, so it's hard to say take my time. I want this to stop now. You know, so and and that's something that you have to work with too. Is you know maybe you. Turn off the smart devices until you can get to that point. Say, look, I need to focus on this part first. And once I'm ready to, to address my smart devices, I'll plug them in and start using them again. You know, that could be something too. Also, we advise people all the time to take a technology, technology break. You know, put the phone in the other room for a few nights. You know, when you come home, when I come home at night, my, my phone goes in the bedroom with the ringer on like it used to when I was a kid. So if somebody calls me, I have to get up and go in the other room and answer the phone. Uh -huh. you know, cut down on some of the screen time a little bit. It'll be good for you. It'll be good for all of us. It, you know, de stress. Absolutely, um, absolutely. But but you were just mentioning stalking. So we're yes. we've kind of been talking a lot cyber stalking, tracking devices, phones, cars that can be controlled. But there's also the actual physical stalking. I have many clients that have like called the police 150 times. Um, they've gotten restraining orders, they've done everything. And this person literally sits outside their house or, you know, knows that her office is here and she'll get the coffee before, even though he's an hour away, he's sitting there waiting every morning and nobody does anything. What do we do about like that kind of, it's either them or the other cases where they've hired and you've got other cars and other people following you can you know, all the time. What do we do about that kind of stuff? One of the things that we do about stalking, and I believe there's a couple of, uh, I would have to look for the, the, the information, but one of the things that we do about stalking is we document it constantly. Mm -hmm. Every time we see them, take a picture of the car, take a picture of the license plate number, write down the location. If you have the geo positioning on the photo, this is outside my office. The coordinates are on the photo that I took with my phone. Uh, create a file. And document that, you know, document everything. And you know, if if the if the you know, the local city police aren't doing anything, go to the county, talk to the sheriff's department or the county police department. You know, if it's if it if it is crossing multiple counties, you know, talk to talk to the other one. Um, but one of the things too is also when you know, consulting an attorney about that too, and discussing about the documentation that's legal. What what do I need to prove this that's going to get the DA's a, attention to make make me get this case in front of them? Um, because that's the other thing too is well I'm not hurt. I, there's no been no physical threat you know we always say you know like you'll scan messages for threats but you know I could put something like oh hey you know you're the bomb in a threat in a, in a in a message and that's not threatening oh hey it work it was great working with you you're the bomb that's awesome but if I've been stalking you for years and I text you and say hey it's me. That's a threat. You mm -hmm. know, that that lets you know that I'm watching. I'm I'm still here. Um, one of the things we also do with physical like calls, text messages, where you're where someone's just harassing you on the phone in a physical situation and someone, we will actually go in and port that number out to like a Google voice number so mm -hmm. it doesn't get disconnected. Okay. Because once you change the number, then they start looking for the new number to harass you on. Um, and then we'll take that number and we'll give it to the attorney or to the law enforcement that's investigating so they can log in and literally see the call. They can listen to the voicemail messages, um, you know, and you don't have to do it. Uh, you don't have to hear that voice because you don't want to respond. If, if I respond after 10 text messages and tell you to stop, then he knows next time I need to send 11, you know, uh, before I get your response. So absolutely do not respond to any communication attempts you know if, if it's a divorce situation they need to be speaking to your attorney at that point and not to you um but the physical aspects we document everything we uh, i i've not to put yourself in physical danger but i've i've let them know i i see you're here i walk up and take the picture of you um if you're wearing a crossbody bag you can put your phone in and turn the camera on and use it as a as a makeshift body cam mm -hmm. oh, that's you know a good idea. that's something that we used to do with uh with with uh, physical protection is you, they make a little cell phone sleeve that fits on your shoulder strap and you could just turn your camera on. You can stand there right in front of them, turn the camera on to record, slap it in there and, and walk up to the car and just circle the car and get the license plate numbers and the information and the face of the person in there. 
You know, if they're stalking, they're they're going to do everything they can not. If you're in a public place, they should be doing everything they can not to make you feel like you're in danger. If you're walking up to the vehicle, you're kind of turning the tables, and I'm stalking you because you're you're right here following me. So I'm going to record everything that I see with you, and then you go into the police department with video. This is the vehicle. Did the guy get upset when you came over and recorded the car? You know, maybe that pushes it to the next level. Um, maybe don't, like I said, don't do anything to put yourself physically in danger. But, you know, uh, we tell people all the time when when someone's following them, someone, especially like predators, you know, walk into the public place. You know, don't be confrontational, but you can turn and look at them and let them know that you see them there. You can say, I, I, I see you. I, I see what's going on here. If you if you turn the camera on and walk up like you're filming, you know, you're, you're letting them know, hey, now I'm watching you. I've got documentation that you're here, you know. And those are some of the things that we do. As long as you're not, as long as it's not physical, a physical threat. Absolutely. I, I give the same advice to my clients because they just freeze when they see, you know, the blue car has been following me and, and they follow me into 15 stores and they're always there. And I run and I'm like, take a picture. 15 stores, you'd have a restraining order by the end of the day. Like if you don't have the proof, and again, even if you, you're you scared and you lock yourself in your car and you drive by and you take a picture, you get, the, yeah. you get everything, right? It is it is essential because it's intimidation until you have a little evidence, they're going to keep on doing it. But it's also like a bully. Different color. So they'll they'll put a different car on it. What was the bullet? Yeah. It's like it's like a bully. Bullies bullies will, will threaten you and threaten you because you don't say anything. You know, and then when you do finally start to stand up to them, nine times out of ten, most most bullies do do go, okay, wait a minute. But you know, let them know you see them. Let them know that you're not afraid. Do like you say, document if you do, if you didn't document it didn't happen. You know, it, it's great saying, I know this is happening. Uh, you know, when I worked for the law firms, there I there I said, Well, I think this is going on. My partner would tell me, Vance, nobody in this room cares what you think. Tell us what you know. Right. You know, tell us what you could prove. You know, that's what we need to see. So, yeah, get the license plate number. Get as much of the vehicles you can. Get as much of the faces as you can. Get video. Juries love, judges love video. If you can, not just a still photo. Get video. And get video with the Target sign and with the grocery store sign. And with, you know, get, hey, can you, do you mind parking your car in front of the car so I can get a picture of you with the sign as well, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Again, this is these are the tools that people need to know. Again, it takes a lot to be fearless when you're shaking in your yes. boots. You are afraid and frozen and you don't feel safe walking to your mailbox. You don't feel safe in your house. It used to be close your windows and lock the door and we felt safe. And now there's so many different ways they can hack in and and you know you just feel so vulnerable. All of a sudden you're at mediation and they're saying something that only you and your lawyer talked about yesterday. You're like, where'd that come from? Again, don't feel safe, don't feel safe. So it's hard to pick up your camera. But as you and I are saying, you know, again, you're not just blatantly, if it's a public area, it's safe. Take the pictures, take the video, get that evidence because without it, the cops are going to be like, well, you said it happened 15 times, but we don't have any proof. So it's not going to stand up. A judge is not going to order a restraining order, blah, 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 right? Until you have some proof. So that is the essential lesson here is as brazen as it is to try to get what you can. You know, the other thing too is maybe you don't even, don't even, um, if you don't feel comfortable, safe walking up to that individual, say, I use the, the, the store, go into the store and say, do y'all have security cameras in the parking lot? I'm being followed and I need to add, request information from your security cameras you know, for the, from, from the police department. Mm -hmm. Like if they're following you into the grocery store, you could easily go to, 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 to it. If you're working with an attorney, like in a divorce case and say, Hey, you follow me to this store, this store, and this store, uh, they all have security cameras in the parking lot. Can we subpoena the security camera footage from this? Most of the most of the businesses will will um, will actually just respond to an informal request from law enforcement for security footage. So if you have an investigator that's looking into you for that and say, "Hey, look, you know, it was this date and this time when the car was in the parking lot, and I was at this store, and he was parked in section B three, and I was parked in section B three, and that that narrows it down. The officer doesn't have to look through hours and hours of video." You know, they can, they can go into a place and say, hey, we think there was a, a, a case going on. We just need this clip from your video to, to make sure that, you know, for the court. Uh, yeah. Or so, so Walgreens, you could send out someone to take the video. 
and just yep. be like, hey, would you mind just take my camera, take a picture of that car, think I'm being followed. Most of the managers would jump and help you. Um, and, you know, or you go in the store, you call the police and say, there's a black car in the driveway. Mm -hmm. It's been following me all day. And the police show up and they talk to the guy. So yeah. you know, do do women stalk more than men or or where's that? Um no, I think that I think that there is that a lot of people, especially in domestic violence, will say that it, it, it is more prevalent with women being abused. Um, but there are a lot of men who will go in to, to say something about a, an abusive partner. And, and when we talk about belief, a lot of a lot of people are like, yeah, whatever, you know, like no, guys don't get abused by a domestic partner. And that's just not true. I think. 19% of men, the male population have been in an abusive domestic, 20, like 25% of, of the 25% of the female population have been in, women have been in, a, in an abusive relationship. I think it's like 19% for men. So it's still, it's, it is there. Um, you know, we just don't seem to, we don't seem to recognize it as much. Uh, men do tend to be more stalkers. Um, and by stalking, I mean, you know, physically stalking you because, it's the it's it's a power dynamic. I'm controlling you. That's what stalking is. It's a, it's a power crime, um, you know. But the, maybe they're stalking you on social media, you know. And, and one of the things with the changes of different things is a social media investigation for Facebook post in 2019 is completely different than it is was in 2021, and it's completely different in 2023 than it was in 2021. So you know, when you start to do that training on how to do those investigations. Tomorrow, it could be completely different than it was yesterday. Uh, and that's another the, another thing that comes into mind is holding people accounting and actually gathering a lot of digital evidence can be problems. Physical is is easier. I can set my date and tamp, stamp, time stamp on my phone and take that photo. Mm -hmm. You know, if the geo positioning is on, it'll tell me right where I took that photo on my phone too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but yeah, document, document, physical, digital, document everything you can. And I had a client just today, we were talking about um, being stalked by her ex and he's doing it on her Instagram story. And he's always the first one she, I don't know, I've never done it, but she's like, there's his name every single day. And so how can someone protect themselves on social media other than really going dark? Because that's how I would advise is you lock that stuff down so they're not actually getting into your messages, changing passwords, all the normal things. But what other advice can you give them on social media? Well, social media, first thing I say is uh, we, we have this conversation all the time because we also have clients who are like, why did mine when I have a 13 year old and you know they're not going to do this? I have a 16 year old and they're not going to do this. Mm -hmm. um, we have conversations about the safety of, of personal media, uh, social media all the time uh, for many various reasons, uh, from everything from domestic violence, stalking to human trafficking as a funnel for for like, uh, you know, recruiting children into child trafficking, that social media. So it is a it is problematic in many ways. Uh, first thing I say is if if it's a business account, you're a business owner. Um, and on your Instagram account, we'll use that one because that was the one you, you used as an example. Um, make sure you're promoting your business and not you. Mm -hmm. So if it's a business account, leave it open to the public, but promote the services you're providing and not not and dial yourself down a little bit. Don't post as much about you. If it's a personal account, put it on private. They have to be a, a follower to see your things. Stories are different because stories can go out to everybody. Mm -hmm. Um but then once again, go back to the basics. Change that password to something completely solid. Go through and add two-factor authentication onto that social media account. You know, go through and maybe change, maybe even change your email address so that it's not the same email that you were using when you knew that person. Maybe go create a new Gmail account and use that Gmail account for your new Instagram account name or so people don't search by your email address and find you. Um, but then go through the friends list, the following list and see who's following you and be like, nope, that person's not real. Nope, that person's not real. And then anytime you get a friend request going forward, be very careful, you know, vet it, look through it, see who they know that you know, because you can block me on Instagram. But if I go through and create another fake profile and try to follow you again, then I'm just doing it with different ones. Also go back through and block them. You know, it, it may not, it, it'll, it'll work for that main account that they've been using. You know, and that's a nice way to say, I don't want you seeing my account anymore. Um, but go through, solidify the security setting, settings. Also, don't 
overshare. Mm -hmm. A lot of us think, you know, a you know, Facebook, Instagram, the social media accounts. We don't own any of that content. We're putting all that stuff up there, and the the companies own that content. Um, they the images are out there. Uh, so so be careful with with what you decide to post. If you're posting, if you're in a in a physically threatening situation and you want to use the social media as outreach, be careful what you're sharing. Uh, location photos. Make sure you don't have location data in the photos. Instagram is pretty good about removing it, but you can download high definition versions of the. Of, this is another reason why I tell people to be private. There's a script that we've used with to 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 demonstrate where you can download an entire Instagram account just with the username. Wow. And it downloads high definition videos and images, and you were able to blow that image up, and in the reflection of the window of one of the houses, see the street sign where the photo was taken that was actually out of the photograph. So, you know, be careful what you share. Uh, the other thing I tell a lot of people on with social media when they're having conversations with children is the two things that social media is not is it's not social and it's not media. Mm -hmm. It is not the same as interacting with your friends. Is not the same as interacting with your family. It's a very poor substitute for that. And you know what? Just like we said earlier, take a break. Go go have coffee with your friend instead of have, sending some messages back and forth. You know, yeah, it's tight during the day, but do some interaction with people offline. And that's get back in that human connection, especially after the pandemic and the lockdowns and stuff. Get back out with people and reconnect with your friends. Absolutely. This has been so helpful. Can you, Vance, tell us how people can reach you? Because you have a lot of services, you have things and programs, and it doesn't matter where they are. I reached out to you last week about a client, and you're like, I can help her. She's over there, but I can do it. Tell us how people can learn more about how you can help them if they're being stalked or have these questions as we've talked about. Oh, uh, you can reach us. Our, our, our website is tsg.nyc. It's very easy. Um, you can reach out to us on the website. There's there's constantly um, there's a there's an information section. There's an email address on there. Uh, you can use you, my email address or you can use the one on the website. Mine is very easy. It's vlong at tsg.nyc. It's very simple. Uh, that's an easy way to get a hold of us. Uh, we do everything, like I said, from businesses and law firms, uh, training police departments. We can come to Denver and train the police department if they need it. You know, like we're, we're more than happy. That's the other thing is the, a lot of those departments don't realize is there's money in the federal infrastructure bill for this type of training specifically. Like it's already there for a lot of this. Um, and the Safer Families Act has funding, grant funding for police departments for, for training in cyber stalking as well. Um, you can come in, do a consultation. We could do a discovery call depending on your level. If you're not comfortable talking about it, we even have um, a password manager guide. That's our first book in our uh, our cybersecurity for everyone series. It's an evergreen PDF that once you once you buy the first copy, if we update it, you get the, an email that says, "Please download your newest version." Uh, the the two factor authentication one's going to be coming out soon as well. They're going to be bundled. You can already pre buy the bundled one. They're like thirty five dollars. Or both of them for sixty. It's I tell people they don't feel comfortable doing the class. You know, get the PDF manual, then you come in, you'll be able to ask better questions. Yeah. For you sure. know, so and anybody else with a with a stalking situation, like I said, they're usually everybody's different. Every situation is different. Mm -hmm. Uh that usually requires a consultation. We'll we'll talk to you for a little bit, do a discovery call and see what your situation looks like and 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 make decisions from there. This has been so helpful. I will put your link below your face there, and then we'll have it down in the notes for anybody that is looking how to find him. He's a wealth of information, everybody. This is what we need, and I am so grateful that you spent time with us today educating us, and I want people to get to your website. If this is what you're dealing with, you need to have answers, and his team can help you. So thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. And yeah, it's, that's what it's all about, is just informing people and getting everybody understanding so thanks for thanks for the platform to do that we appreciate you being here thank you thanks wow wasn't that great we could have talked 
for hours. We did talk for a while before we even started. And I was like, wait, wait, we should be recording this. This is great. So I hope that you found this helpful. I hope that you don't need this kind of help. But if you are with a narcissist and maybe you're going through that nasty divorce, there's a really good chance that they are either stalking you or watching you or listening to you because that's what they do. They want the control of putting fear in your heart, making you never feel safe. So I hope this helped you guys. This is Tracy Malone. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, please do. Um, and visit my website, NarcissistAbuseSupport.com. Uh, I just found out that we are the leading website for narcissistic abuse education. And that's pretty darn cool. So I will see you guys next time. Thank you.